this award, this introduction gives me unique pleasure, not only because of the qualities of the individual, but because of her, because her accomplishments go so much to the heart of the mission of Vermont Law School. Most recently, Lois Schiffer served as the general counsel of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In her role at NOAA, she has overseen legal issues relating to management of the nation's marine fisheries, protection of marine mammals, threatened and endangered species, coastal zone management, as well as monitoring oceanic, atmospheric, and climate data. Ms. Fisher, Schiffer has a long and distinguished career as one of this country's most preeminent lawyers. Prior to her, her role as the chief lawyer at NOAA, she served as general counsel to National Public Radio, chief counsel to the National Capital Planning Commission, and worked for the Audubon Society. She also served as the top environmental man, lawyer in the Department of Justice under President Clinton. We're delighted that she has agreed to join us in celebrating the class of 2017. Lois Schiffer, it is the greatest pleasure to introduce you and to welcome you to a community that admires your work and that celebrates the opportunity to grant you an honorary degree. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I am so pleased to be here. Indeed, it is a high honor for me, an environmental lawyer for 40 years, to receive an honorary degree from the premier environmental law school. Thursday, a friend of mine died unexpectedly, and so I dedicate this speech to the memory of Joan Burzon. Importantly, congratulations to you, the Vermont Law School students receiving degrees today in recognition of your hard work and educational achievements. I join your families, friends, colleagues, and faculty and staff in celebrating your significant accomplishment. A graduation is also called a commencement, meaning an opportunity as well as an obligation to move forward. It is your opportunity and obligation at this particularly challenging time for our nation and our democracy that I will to the, which I will address my remarks. I speak today of our country, established under a constitution that reflects important principles of democracy, justice, equality, and the rule of law. We have had challenges in applying these principles, but the rule of law has held. Yet, since the 2016 election, we wake each morning to news that causes us to think what is happening to our country. You graduates, as law-trained people, who build, I would say, on the encouragement to say yes of President Mahali and the stirring words of uh, Jessica Bullock, knowing that you have skills and values, you as law-trained people have a clear understanding of our U.S. Constitution, its three branches of government and separation of powers, and its framework for a rule of law that we must hold on to. You have studied how our nation's institutions and the values they reflect, executive, Congress, courts, and the press, as well as the role of citizens as voters and petitioners. At a time when the rule of law seems to be in chaos, how can you use this training to reassert our democracy? For those of you from other countries, please learn from our challenge. Since many of you have studied in Vermont Law School's premier field, environmental law, my career field, I will focus on how the environment and the environmental laws that protect it can provide a common ground to bring people together to reconfirm and resecure this rule of law and the important values and statutory and constitutional principles that underlie that concept. You are our hope, and I will urge you to take up the cause. What is the rule of law? Excerpts from an eloquent statement by the Secretary General of the United Nations made in 2004 
provide a good definition. Quote, a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated. It requires as well measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of law. That's the end of the quote. This principle of rule of law that everyone in our country, including the president, vice president, and their aides, are subject to the laws, and its corollary from the US Constitution that each branch of government has an important checks and balances role is implicit in every course you have taken in law school. The principle is exhibited in the orderly transition of power when a new president is sworn in. As law school graduates, you have a particular understanding that our country is founded on a constitution that reflects our social contract, a fundamental understanding that we are a society together with reciprocal commitments and benefits. While we may differ as to the specific content of these obligations and benefits or the most effective means to carry out these commitments, no one can honestly expect that she lives, he or she lives in a country alone without interdependence with the other people who also reside here. We cannot keep rivers from being polluted without community. We cannot provide for the common defense or promote the general welfare without working together, often through our federal government. And as law-trained people, you know that the goal of the law is the search for the truth bolstered by the Socratic method, the adversary principle, and the rules of professional responsibility that bind licensed lawyers. Our president disregards all of these principles. Instead, he marches to his own drummer as to ethics and the separation of personal business from the public interest. His ad hominem challenges to individual judges and to the authority of courts is startling. The ban on Muslim travelers so quickly set aside by a number of judges ignored fundamental legal precepts. Certainly the recent removal of FBI Director Comey in the midst of the FBI's investigation of whether there is a Russian connection to the election and to his campaign raises concerns. Other actions may not abrogate laws but are certainly challenges to customs and norms. Putting aside, pulling EPA climate change data from the public website, failing to make personal tax returns available, withholding the list of visitors to the White House. The crucial role of a free press is mocked and impeded. Especially troublesome is the post-truth, alternative facts approach to knowledge. So the times seem particularly unruly. Our long-established principles for organizing our nation are assaulted daily. It becomes easier to attack others than to join as a community to create a better future. Truth itself becomes a casualty. So we despair for our country. We need a non-divisive collective way forward with hope. Protecting the environment is a strong place to start. Let me first talk about our shared environment. All of us breathe the air, drink the water, view the beautiful Vermont landscapes, perhaps hike in the Green Mountains, or we have a favorite spot elsewhere, a garden, a park, a backyard, or even a little patch of sky. We live on the same planet, now affected by climate change. This shared physical environment provides common ground to start to talk, including with those who may disagree with us. Everyone here shares that environment, whatever you studied in law school and whether or not you attended law school. So for each of you in the audience, listen well. For those of you who have studied environmental law or other areas of law based on common ground among our people, you have a particularly strong tool. It is our common environment, and so it is to that tool that I now turn. So how can each of us use the environment, and to those of you with the training, environmental law, to understand and heal our nation? I have some ideas about that, as my work has been to use the tools of environmental law 
to protect our, and I stress our, environment. Environmental law can be a tool for communication about the importance of devotion to the common good. To encourage you to stand on the common ground of the environment to reaffirm our democracy and to use environmental law to underscore the importance of common ground on the environment and the rule of law, I provide examples from three cases I have worked on. The first example is the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill on which I have spent many years. People in our country want clean water in our rivers, lakes, streams, and oceans to drink, to swim, and to fish in, to support fish and wildlife, to support health and enjoyment. This desire for clean water is common ground for discussion among people of different views about how to secure that end. Moreover, we have laws in our country to reach this goal. Our most basic clean water law, the Federal Clean Water Act, was enacted as a response to the Cuyahoga River catching fire because it was so polluted. Its companion, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, was a response to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Implementation of these laws, the rule of law, underscores how environmental protection through environmental law can bring people together. The facts of the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill of 2010 have been thoroughly presented on television at the time and more recently in a commercial movie. So I will be very brief. Starting in April 2010, a well, a 20, April 20, 2010, a well had blowout from the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico killed 11 people injured others, and dumped 4.9 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico until it was stopped 87 days later. In addition to the lives lost, this huge disaster caused enormous environmental and economic damage. The Clean Water Act and Oil Pollution Act encourage compliance through punishment for noncompliance especially when it causes environmental and economic damage and provides help for the people and ecosystems adversely affected. The laws establish civil and criminal penalties for those who cause spills and requirements that those who cause spills must restore the natural resources to the condition they would have been in without the spill, as well as compensate for lost use of those resources. This BP Deepwater Horizon spill caused grave injury, environmental damage, and loss of jobs and livelihood to a large number of people in of five states in the Gulf, Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas. These are states where many members of the public and state politicians stress their concern about so-called federal overreach and overregulation. Yet the injury was great, and the interest in punishment, compensation, and restoration serious. Using the framework of the Clean Water Act and the Oil Pollution Act, as well as other laws, five Republican governors, a mix of state attorneys general, and the Obama administration agencies worked together for more than six years to develop legal cases, develop restoration plans, identify projects for a billion dollars of early restoration funding provided by BP, and ultimately to settle the civil lawsuits, including the natural resource damages components for many billions of dollars. The federal government also obtained criminal plea agreements from several companies, including BC, with mo uh, 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 BP, with most of the multi-billion dollar fines going to Gulf restoration. The natural resource damage restoration plans have de been developed with extensive public participation, including multiple public meetings and briefings, and a full environmental impact statement under the, under the National Environmental Policy Act. Work on a number of projects has commenced, and plan implementation will continue for 15 years. Some projects have been completed, and the Gulf is on its way to being environmentally restored from this horrendous environmental catastrophe. All of this work reaffirms the public's support for clean water and implicitly for the laws that protect it, as well as for enforcement of those laws. In cases like this, we stand on the common ground of environmental restoration and protection to affirm the rule of law and re the social contract. 
Example two, Triana, Alabama Superfund site. The American people do not want to live or work near toxic dump sites. In late 1980, building on earlier hazardous waste treatment cases and responding to such catastrophes as Love Canal and in New York and Valley of the Drums in Kentucky, Congress enacted a statute with a very long name, the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA or the Superfund Law. Those responsible for contributing to hazardous waste sites have a joint and several obligation to clean them up. Cleanup is expensive, and companies and individuals have not liked to pay, so implementing this statute has met with significant resistance. With amendment, improved implementation approaches and practices, and successful outcomes, the Superfund law has helped deter unlawful handling of hazardous substances and affected many successful cleanups and land reuses. Again, a specific example that I worked on um, with details drawn, I note, from the EPA website. From 1947 to 1970, Olin Corporation manufactured DDT in a facility at least from the Federal Corps of Army Corps of Engineers near the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. In 1970, Olin shut down the plant, leaving behind extensive DDT contamination from wastewater discharge into the Huntsville Spring Branch, a nearby river, and from spills during the manufacturing process. In 1979, the Tennessee Valley Authority released a report showing contamination of fish near Triana, Alabama at 40 times the federal limit. Triana is a small town downstream from the Olin facility that has an African-American population and had a vigorous mayor, Clyde Foster. Mayor Foster persuaded the Centers for Disease Control to test some of the residents who turned out to have high blood levels of DDT. In 1980, the residents of Triana filed a tort suit against Olin. And on behalf of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Justice sued Olin for cleanup, later adding a claim under the new Superfund law. Multiple federal agencies had a role at the site. Experts were engaged and extensive discovery was taken. Triana had competent counsel who worked closely with Department of Justice lawyers. Ultimately, white residents of areas nearby filed their own tort suit as well. Eventually, the very diligent federal judge Probst, to whom the cases were assigned, convened a meeting and specified a settlement judge who brought all the parties together around a common settlement in principle that after many late nights and phone calls, including with Judge Probst, was finalized on December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1982. Olin's cleanup of the DDT in the area around the Redstone Arsenal went on for 10 years. Testing in 1995 showed DDT contamination levels down 97% in the water and approximately 86% in the fish. In addition, Olin compensated individuals $19 million over a five-year period and established a $5 million health care program. In sum, because people want environmental cleanups, there is support for implementation of this law by affected people, with a caution that responsible parties are often concerned about the expense. This is the rule of law at work. Example three, protecting public lands, the Northwest Forest Plan. The United States has extensive national forests and rangelands managed by the U.S. Forest Service. A recent report notes, quote, our forests and rangelands are national treasures. 60 million Americans rely on drinking water that originates on our 193 million acres of national forests and grasslands. They support 200,000 jobs and contribute over $13 billion to local economies every year, close quote. While there may be strong disagreements over how these lands are managed, public support for these forests and for the clean water that comes from them is strong. These forests are managed under federal laws, including the National Forest Management Act of 1976. Managing forests includes consideration of the habitat of, that some of them provide for endangered and threatened species under the Endangered Species Act 
and public participation under the National Environmental Policy Act, among other laws. Managing the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest became especially contentious. I've been told to stop till the train whistle stops. <laughs> the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest became especially contentious in the late 1980s as the timber industry chose to blame its economic decline on endangered species protection, symbolized by the spotted owl. Although in 1990 the owl was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, the Forest Service proceeded with timber sales that affected the owl's habitat. Under the applicable laws in 1991, Federal Judge William Dwyer enjoined all federal timber sales in the area until the Forest Service came up with a plan for the owl. Facing a jobs versus the environment and war on the woods out in the woods outcry, and I must say I think jobs in the environment is, versus the environment is a false dichotomy, but reluctant to continue to defend a decision for a waiver under the so-called God Squad provision of the Endangered Species Act. In spring 1993, new President Bill Clinton convened the Northwest Forest Summit. At the summit, the president said, the government's effort must be scientifically sound, economically credible, and legally responsible. The new administration committed to evaluating and developing a plan that would provide a billion board feet of timber per year from federal forests and also environmental protection. I note that several of the Vermont Law School faculty were involved in some of these cases. I arrived back at the Justice Department a few months after the summit and quickly began work to assure that the plan would meet legal requirements so that we could get the injunction on sales lifted. This effort required reconciling a large number of interests in a new administration. Agencies were only beginning to learn to work together, and legal advice regarding specific steps to meet the law was not always eagerly welcomed. With extensive analysis, scientific input, and an environmental impact statement developed with public involvement, a plan for providing for substantial timber sales and environmental protection was finally adopted. The government moved to lift the injunction so that with appropriate environmental protections, timber sales could move forward. In a detailed opinion issued on December 21, 1994, a great holiday present, Judge Dwyer upheld the plan, giving approval to the facts that many agencies had worked together, that they had taken an ecosystem approach to the resources, and they that they planned for continuing monitoring and adjustment if necessary. The decision was upheld on appeal, on, on appeal. Crucially, the framework of the environmental laws established standards that provided ground rules for developing a plan that took into account the full range, range of interests. Um, government, timber companies, environmental groups, and others were bound by this law decision. You may ask where was the common ground here since some wanted to cut timber and others wanted to protect the environment. But healthy forests are essential to growing timber over time and the common interest in protecting forests provides such common ground. Thus there is a basis to begin discussion on public lands as well, taking into account environmental protection and jobs under the rule of law. A quick mention of clean air and climate change another key area that I mention only briefly. All of us value clean air, to breathe, to protect our health, to see the scenery clearly. The Clean Air Act provides a complicated but effective framework for reducing air pollution across the country. Since greenhouse gases that cause climate change pollute the air, it also provides a basis to begin to regulate and limit those greenhouse gases, particularly in the absence of action by Congress. 
Despite contention to the contrary, most Americans are concerned about climate change. Discussions about the common ground of wanting clean air and addressing climate change for ourselves and our children and grandchildren may be a basis for coming together and emphasizing the role of existing law in meeting these challenges. So where do these examples leave us? In each of these examples, environmental improvement could be achieved only by people working together, including to accommodate seemingly competing interests. No one can clean up a river or improve air quality alone. To improve or maintain a clean and healthy environment, we need cooperation. Further, each of these examples, in each of these examples, existing laws provide a basis for addressing environmental issues, including a framework for cooperation and helping to resolve disputes. People or companies may complain about the expense and complexity of complying with those laws, but the laws provide a framework that we expect people to follow. That is what the rule of law means. Finally, in each example, standing on the common ground of environmental protection, we used the rule of law to address concerns and make improvements. It is on that common ground that I urge you to stand. For our graduates, you have the privilege of a law education and an important grounding in the rule of law that is a foundation of our nation's social contract. It is your opportunity and your obligation. I urge you to use your experience and knowledge to act, regardless of your politics or party, to work with others to assure that they understand the importance of the rule of law to our nation and to our democracy. First, participate in our democracy. Register to vote and vote. Help others to do so. Call, email, and write your legislators, federal, state, and local. Read bills, talk to neighbors, go to demonstrations, write letters to the editor, uh, comment on regulations, handle pro bono cases, consider running for office. Be engaged, get others to engage, make your views known. Second, in particular as graduates of the preeminent environmental law school, I urge you to stand on the common ground of the environment to educate people about the importance of and need for the rule of law to the working of our democracy. Consider what is important to you in our physical environment and why. Is it a special river, a hiking trail, a green mountain vista, a park, a backyard garden, a fishing hole? What are your stories about why it's important to you? Then seek out the doubters of the vitality of our democracy and denigrators of our environmental laws. Talk to them and hear their stories. Even those who decry our democracy and those who challenge our government's role in protecting the environment are likely to have an environmental concern that matters to them. Consider how you can use environmental law or other law you have learned about here to build a bridge to understanding of the importance of laws and the role of law more generally. State the legal principles in plain English. Remember that in a 2014 poll, only 36% of adults knew the three branches of our American government. Your efforts can surely make a difference. For family and friends who are here to honor the graduates, I urge you to learn from the graduates you honor so that you can become active yourselves to secure these fundamental values of our nation. For the faculty among us, great thanks for your crucial role in furthering the fundamental values of our nation by teaching about the rule of law, our constitution, and the principles of our democracy. Please keep it up. For all of us, the hope in this challenging time for our country is in the actions we can take and work we can do to reaffirm the principles of our democracy, including the rule of law. One final note of optimism and encouragement. Senator Robert Kennedy, in June 1966, spoke eloquently in South Africa about the importance of taking action. He said, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope 
and those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance, close quote. Standing on the common ground of the environment and its protection, let us contribute to that current to assure the future of our country and our democracy through the rule of law. Thank you.